These are again my disclosure, some way related because I will present again some implants. As Uber just show us, showed us, it is well known that for increasing the implant survival, the cap must be placed in the true acetabulum. Exactly what it didn't happen in one side here, this bone graft, but what was done on the other side. But sometimes the surgeons forget it because there may be some technical problems, some difficulties. We have seen a nice case this morning, but there was no chance in that case. But if you do this and you put in the paleoacetabulum in a young lady, 19 years old, that's what you can expect uh, a few years later. And now it's much more demanding and difficult to go with this. We have a very small cup with an offset liner, the smaller that you have with the 28 just avoiding to revise the stem and lengthening the leg, of course. So in high dislocated hips, this translation to the paleocetabulum leads to a lengthening of the femur, sometimes unacceptable, and the shortening of the is, is necessary to avoid damages. This is the general concept. But how much lengthening is acceptable? Really, to be honest, we don't know how much it is. As a general consensus, the maximum lengthening should be four centimeters. We know that femoral nerve is at higher risk than sciatic nerve, to be honest. We don't know about vessels. There is not so many reports of vessel damages during lengthening. I mean one stage, of course. I'm speaking about one stage lengthening. What about the soft tissue tension? We have to balance the abductors and the adductors, the previous care on these hips. This is another issue. And how much is the acceptance of the patient and again, we have different situation when there is a bilateral high dislocation or the more tough cases when you have a unilateral crow 4 on one side and the crow 2, 3 on the other side, which is the more demanding situation. So you have to evaluate on some way how much it is. When we look at this, this is a, a, a review in our EFOR journal. And the authors say three centimeters is the maximum acute stretching distance that the sciatic nerve and femoral artery can tolerate. But it is based on very old evidences. You know, these studies from the 70s, these studies from the 80s, they simply say significant lengthening increases the risk of nerve palsy. In case of peroneal palsy, the average lengthening was two centimeters and seven. It was 4.4 when this, all the sciatic nerve was suffering, you know that the first part of the sciatic nerve was suffering is the peroneal part because it's the, most, the, the more superficial one. But the more recent, that are not very recent, like this is coming from Bern, they look at this big series of patients and they found no correlation between lengthening and nerve palsy. And they conclude that the nerve injury is most commonly caused by direct or indirect mechanical trauma and not by limb lengthening on its own. Or another series, big series, lengthening between 0 0.4 and 5.8 centimeters, so maybe in some cases a big lengthening, one palsy, and again nerve injuries after total hypertrophy may be caused by local insult and may not be related to elongation. So we can say that nowadays we are not sure what is the real lengthening that we can do during a one-stage procedure. Anyway, there are different techniques because we don't want to take the risk to go more than four or five in the virgin hips in the young patient for shortening the femur. They are mainly with cemental stem, but also with cemented. They can be proximal, Z, chevron shaped, or transverse, which is the most employed, as we've seen this morning, or distal one, the less employed, or with or without bone graft. There is a general good results with the technique, even if it is a demanding procedure with a high rate of complication. We have been employing since 1999 a simple oblique shaped shortening osteotomy at the subtrochanteric level. And the conical shaped stem have shown to be effective and of simple use for stabilizing this. It can be modular or not. Again, it's not the main important thing. The oblique subtrochanteric osteotomy is run by medial distally to lateral proximally with the first cut. The second cut is parallel to the first one. And it's easier to do this type of cuts than the complex one like the shape of the chevron or, or the step ones, at least in our hands. And it's more stable in rotation, 
but because of a, and because of a more current tatara, more potential of healing compared to the transverse one. The pro plan is completed with the accession of the prosthesis and the fixation of the stem has to be distal at the diaphysial level. Now is how we do the planning at the moment, which is on our PAX system. This is what we can expect. This is a 65 millimeters of lengthening. We can expect around 25 millimeter or shortening, but we have to see it during the surgery from how much tension we have. I will show you briefly. And so this is how we follow the prop plan with the stem, which stabilize and the healing of the osteotomy without not so many hardware inside. The fixation of osteotomy, as a matter of fact, in the majority of cases, is done by the prosthetic device of self that presses the proximal part against the distal part, looking for distal fixation. If you can have some torsional instability or not sure about the stability of that, you can also add one surclash with a tension band anchored to another surclash distally to the distal part of the osteotomy. Very simple, simply to the surgical technique. This is the leg in 90 degrees. This is a posterior lateral approach. The head has been resected. There is a preparation with the reamer. We do it with the, not by hands, but with the, with the reamer. Then we go with the trial component. We try to reduce, it's not impossible. So we start with the first cut that you can see. This is the posterior aspect of the femur. The femur is internally rotated from medial distally to lateral proximal toward the greater trochanter. This is the first cut. The second cut is parallel to the first one. And we suggest to remove as less as possible according to the different cases and the prop plan. And this is the removed bone, which is, has a trapezoidal that shape instead of a rectangular one, because the osteotomy is oblique. Then you go with the trial component. You can see here is the resected bone, is the osteotomy which is closed. And now we try to reduce. But the reduce, even after some soft tissue release, it's impossible. It's too stiff, too much elongation. So again, we can cut another half centimeter, what in it parallel, and we increase the length of the osteotomy. And uh, this is the final. Uh, situation. We report about 16 hips with a minimum follow-up of five years, 11 women and one man at the mean age of 53 year, uh, years. The technique every, in all the cases was a small hemispherical plastic cup in the paleoacetabulum. All conical stem, 13 of them were modular. Shortening resection between two and six centimeters. Additional fixation with cables in four cases. In two cases with a fracture of the greater uh, trochanter, I will show you because it's a bad complication. There is a, a great improvement of the heritage score, this mean follow-up. And what is, as we've seen in the video from CAPS this morning, there is a great improvement about the limp and the ability of this patient to walk as young as they are. Complication, no neurological vascular damages. One non-union of, of the osteotomy, I will show that we did not arise because it's not symptomatic. And three, dislocation, two uh, solved with close reduction. One needed an upper reduction, a longer head to improve the offsets also with no more recurrence. This is the case of non-union of the greater tocanter, but it's, as the patient feels quite well, we, we did not revise her. But now, for this reason, we put every time a distal preventive surclash and also a proximal one. And as you can see in these cases here, as the shape of the femur in such a case is not round, it's not circular, it's many times oval. You see, there is one diameter which is prevalent on the other one. And what is dangerous, of course, is the smaller one that you can you know, see sometimes in the AP view. So this is the real minor diameter of your femur, you can break with that. So as you can see, there is a small crack here. So this is a preventive surclash distally and the preventive surclash proximally, as exactly as we do in case of revision with the long Wagner type stem. This is one, one of the most demanding cases because this patient was 75 and this is a major risk for complication and failure in this type of surgeries, the age of this situation. But you can see that this lady has a polyomyelitis on the other side. And they don't know why, what was, was the reason that after so many years, she was not able to walk anymore with the polyomyelitis uh, 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 lower limb on one side and the other situation of dislocated hip on the other side. 
So after trying to postpone and postpone and convince them not to do surgery, we accepted to do surgery on that. And this is a two years follow-up of that patient with the healing of the osteotomy and the preventive circulation. In conclusion, in case of high dislocations, the cap must be placed in the paleocetabulum. The amount of the resulting lengthening that can be safely accepted is not clearly defined nowadays. Oblique subtrochanteric shortening osteotomy techniques has shown to be effective and relatively simple procedure. Cornical stems are suitable for this type of femoral reconstruction. And I thank you very much for your attention.